Hello, welcome to MJH Live, the online public program series of New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm Samantha Shokin, manager of public programs, and today on the 77th anniversary of the historic rescue that saved 7,200 Danish Jews, we are excited to bring together the creators of the 1991 film, A Day in October, a dramatic and compelling resistance narrative that brings one, one Jewish family story to life. The intention of this program is to raise awareness of the film in order to make it more widely available to the public. We are joined today by screenwriter Damien Slattery, director Kent, Kenneth Madsen, and actor, actress Kelly Wolf, uh, who stars in the film. And hopefully uh, Tova Felcha will be joining us at some point, um, though she might be having technical difficulties right now. Uh, so moderating our program today is Dr. Lori Weintraub, a professor of history and founding director of the Wagner College Holocaust Center in Staten Island, our co-presenters of today's program. Lori is currently editing the book, Eyewitness to History, Documents of the Holocaust and completing a, a project on heroines of the Holocaust, including the renowned female resistance fighter, Zivia Lubetkin. In fact, Lori's Heroines of the Holocaust project was one of the museum's very first online webinars back in March. Lori, Lori co-authored the play Rise Up, Young Holocaust Heroes, and has, has received numerous awards for community building and interfaith ju social justice activism. We are very pleased to welcome her back to MJH Live. Hello, Lori. Um, before I turn it over to Lori, who will introduce our panelists, I'd like to remind our audience that this program is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube in the coming days. I'll send out a link to that recording in my follow-up email. Finally, we will leave room for Q&A at the conclusion of the program. To participate, please submit your questions into the chat. Thank you. And now, please welcome Professor Lori Weintraub. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me, Samantha. It's a pleasure to be back and a privilege um, to be helping to organize today's program to mark such an important anniversary. 30 years ago, our panelists created a breathtaking film capturing this heroic story, forward-looking in its inclusion of Jewish voices, women's voices, and precisely the film we need in 2020. During the month of October of 1943, 94% of Danish Jews were rescued with the support of the Danish government, the resistance movement, and sympathetic ordinary citizens, men and women, from doctors to social workers to fishermen. On Rosh Hashanah at the main synagogue in Copenhagen, a few days before the deportations, a warning went out of Nazi plans from their rabbi. Resistance groups helped raise money to passage uh, to save the Jewish passengers on ferries to neutral Sweden. Three years before the appearance of the well-known Steven Spielberg film Schindler's List about the rescue of 1,000 Jews from Poland, Kenneth Madsen produced A Day in October about the rescue of 7,000 Jews and 700 of their non-Jewish relatives. This is an extraordinary part of history but also an inspiring story for the present of selfless acts taken for neighbors and strangers at considerable risk of capture by the Gestapo during a period of martial law. We hope that the outcome of today's program will be a demand for further showings of this film. Our conversation today and this film on the Danish rescue is very important for a deeper understanding of the Holocaust and how ordinary citizens in Europe and the United States made decisions um, how genocide happened and how it is remembered. And with that, I would like to introduce our very special panelists. Um, first of all, the director and producer of the film we are discussing today, A Day in October. Ken Madsen built a hugely successful transatlantic career in TV commercial directing in the 1980s, working out of Brooklyn for several years before returning to Copenhagen to build a filmmaking operation, a studio complex in the center of Copenhagen, a, a film equipment and rental business, and a feature film production company. Um, he was the creative force, pouring his resources into the making of a day in October, mentoring countless filmmakers and creating alliances with uh, um, different producers, including of Babette's Feast. He's also an entrepreneur and among other projects has created Empire Bio and Art House Cinema. 
Right now, he is trying to um, raise funds to digitize this film in 4K so the story can win over a new audience. Um, Ken, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. We look forward to hearing more about um, your project. Thank you. Ke yeah. Kelly Wolf, who plays in the film Sarah Kublitz, the daughter um, of a Jewish family shaken by the Nazi occupation, starred in another Holocaust-based feature film, Triumph of the Spirit, just a few months before she made A Day in October. Um, it, it also starred William Defoe and Robert Logia, and we'll be talking to her to ask her about these two films. Her notable works across television include Grey's Anatomy, Stephen King's Graveyard Shift, and Margaret, and on stage, she memorably earned the Drama League Award for Outstanding Performance in John Robert Spade's The Substance of Fire, at the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles. And just two years ago, she starred in Paris Time at the Capitol Rep in Albany. Thank you, Kelly, for coming. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. And um, finally, Damien Slattery is our, the screenwriter of this film, it, based in Brooklyn, New York, has written numerous scripts. Other Denmark-inspired projects include an English language adaptation of the classic Danish film, Harry and the Butler, which was Oscar nominated for Best Foreign Language Film in 1961, and a script for a limited series dedicated to the life and tales of Hans Christian Andersen. An experienced documentary writer, Slater, Slatery has written for National Geographic TV, History, Discovery, and more, and has been in publishing for decades at iconic brands like Sports Illustrated, Time and currently Fast Company. Um, thank you so much, Damien. Thank you, Lori. Lori, Lori is a pal from the Wagner College's Holocaust Center that everybody should look up as well. So you yes. do a great work, and I'm thrilled to be a board member uh, uh, on the committee uh, that supports that Holocaust Center. So uh, cheers to Wagner for uh, doing all the hard work, at, and you're the inspiration for that, Lori. Thank you so much, Damien. It's, a, it's so great working with you and the other members of the board of the Holocaust Center. And, um, and now I want to turn to the film and ask um, Ken, uh, what inspired yep. you to tell the story about the Danish Jews as your first film when you transitioned from commercials um, to this medium? And how were you able to get this film produced 30 years ago? Yes, well, uh, first of all, uh, in the 80s, I was working in New York as a commercial director. And the first uh, kind of uh, contract I got was with a, uh, a production company called uh, Bean Khan Films, uh, a director called uh, Mr. Bean and uh, a producer called Body Khan. And uh, on all our trips and travel and all the time we spent together, he started uh, telling me stories that I, as a Dane, wasn't really aware of, which was the the idea that the that the Danish king uh, under the wall was was riding around the streets with uh, with a star on his his uh, his arm, and one thing took another, um, uh, and then simply uh, getting to know Damien. And I have to, I, I can't even remember, it's a long time ago, how, how we have to met up first time. Uh, but there was something intriguing with the, um, what I was confronted with, that Danes were these, this special thing happening in Denmark that I, I'm from the 50s and I, it's, it's not something that takes place in Danish history lessons in school. Um, so, so I was intrigued with this, this whole thing that we were, and why we were, why Danes were were, were doing this, and it became more and more uh, a story I wanted to tell for future generations, and also for as a first-time director, it was a it was a little story. Um, it it was the huge big bang. So uh, I think we, we Damien and I worked worked it out to to a, a great script and. I went back to Denmark with my family and spent um, a lot of time doing commercials. And then I went through the, we have an incredible institution called the Danish Film Institute, who actually helps uh, artists and directors like myself and producers to, to set up this, uh, this project. 
Um, at the same time, I had all some of the, the businesses in the film business, like uh, trucks and studios and, and lights and equipment that I was capable of putting into into the project as an, as an investment. So it was done uh, on a budget and maybe Damien can, I don't, I think we're talking about in today's exchange rate, we were talking about like $2 million to do this movie. So uh, together with uh, Philippe Revier and Jus Besta who did uh, uh, Babette's Feast, we, we, we put together a team with the cameraman from Babette's Feast with the set designers uh, with all the technical crew came from from Babette's feast and um, some fans, uh, you know that was like that was the Danish part. Then then of course came the whole the whole idea about the casting, and I have to tell you that that was an experience that that was absolutely wonderful. And I I said that to uh, Kelly last time we met. It was uh, when when she showed up to the casting. Session. I actually, was that in Los Angeles or New York? I'm not quite sure. It was in LA, yeah. Um, again, it, 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 it was an experience. Uh, it was, it, it, there were so many people that, uh, that we also, we got a gentleman called Leo Goldberger, who is a professor at NYU, um, who escaped to Sweden himself. Again, you have to understand Sweden is very, very close by. I mean, it's just, on the smallest place, it's like a 10 minute boat ride, uh, but it was a very long ride at, the, at that time because it was hidden in, in, uh, in fisher boat, fishermen's boats and, 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 and those kind of things. And it, it, was, it was a very long trip. Uh, and then, you know, it's, um, it's also uh, an experience as a first time director. I, I could use a lot of my experience in, in, in commercials, uh, technically, um, and then again, rely on, on, on the acting from, from Kelly and uh, Tova and Daniel and uh, uh, D.B. Sweeney uh, and, and the other Danish people that were in. We, we had a, a, a nice handful of Danish actors who didn't speak, they, they, didn't, they didn't speak their own language. So it was kind of... Uh, Mm -hmm. challenge but i think we succeeded i think the production value of the film is great and which is why basically that i i tried to move this whole thing along with what we've been talking about and meeting here is the fact that behind me here you you'll see a lot of cans of film uh, and the film um, was digitized or not digitized it was actually a, a, a beta cam copy that was uh, used to do uh, uh, distribution but it can't be distributed any longer so that's 10 years the, the, we haven't been able to see it or show it anywhere. Uh, so, so I thought if I can do something, one thing is to make the movie and go through that process and learn and tell a story that's important to be told. It was important to be told 30 years ago and 20 years ago and 10 years ago, and it's important to be told now and in the future. And the only way I can do that is by setting up this um, situation where we can re-digitize the film from the original negative uh, in a 4K version, because today's market, the the Netflix people are the one that set the standard and the and the technical uh, standards, and um, we haven't been able to to get it to those uh, platforms. But that is the objective. That's what we like to do in the future. Um, so I set up a web page, uh, which is basically a day in October dot com. It's just one word, a day in October dot com, and there people can contact me and, and look at uh, what and why we want to do this project, which is important. It's never been more important. Uh, and that's, that's what I can give back because it was, it was a, a, a fantastic challenge and fantastic opportunity to be able to do this film. I went on to do other movies uh, as a producer. Um, I did a, a, a great piece with Christian Bale and, uh, uh, Gabriel Burns and Helen Mirror laid on it called The Prince of Jotland. I did a couple of ch 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 children's movies that you can see behind me, and it's been it's been a pleasure. But but it's very dear to me to get uh, Dana Toba out there again uh, and tell the story so nobody forgets. Yeah, it's interesting that um, it's the only nation where Yad Vashem has, instead of designating individuals as righteous Gentiles, um, only mm. in Denmark. They chose to designate the whole country, um, the resistance movement, 
uh, wanted it to be known that it was a collective act. And, um, and so it's very unique in Holocaust history as a model. Um, and yet there haven't been that many films about this. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, I would like to show the whole film to my students and not just talk to them about it. So I'm really hoping right. that this will come through with digitalization. Um, I and I, so. I, I wanted to ask Kelly, um, because you worked on two Holocaust films very close to each other um, in time. Um, one was set in Auschwitz. Um, and Triumph of the Spirit, and then this one in Copenhagen. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the experience of being in both these films and the value you think they have for, for Holocaust knowledge and education and their personal impact on you as well? Sure, sure. Um, when I went to work on Triumph of the Spirit, which I worked on first, that film takes place primarily in Auschwitz. We shot in Auschwitz. Um, we spent a great deal of time there, and um, then after doing that film, to get to work on a film like A Day in October, it was cathartic for me personally to um, get to work on something where my character was free and um, didn't end up in the camps. And um, it was incredibly wonderful to get to work on both of them. But when I got, when I read the script of A Day in October, I, I loved it so much for so many reasons. And um, I think that also entertainment, entertainment, even though these are very heavy subjects, is a way for people to digest um, history in a way that um, can inform and enlighten subject matters. And I think that the film that Kenneth made and led us all to make really brings to light a piece of history that is unknown. Um, I'm Jewish. I grew up going to Sunday school and having a bat mitzvah. I worked on Triumph of the Spirit, and it wasn't until I read the script of A Day in October that I became aware of the Danish resistance and the Danish people and what they did as a country to not do to the Jews what everybody else in the world had done. So I think that it's so important that this film be re-released so that we can bring more awareness. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think, you know, we, we, these stories of rescue and resistance are so powerful. Um, and I think, you know, you put it well that, that um, except for perhaps Hannah Senesh and, um, you know, an occasional uh, rescuer like Raoul Wallenberg, we're still learning um, very much about this other side of, of resistance. And, and that's why I think this film is quite special because 30 years ago was already talking about something that um, we weren't ready for in a way, this strong female uh, protagonist that you played. So I look forward to coming back and asking you more about Sarah's character. Um, I just wanted to first have a sense of each of you as, you know, you're contributing to the, to the project. And so I wanted to ask Damien to talk a little bit about his journey um, as an Irish Catholic from Staten Island um, to become the script writer of this really important film about uh, Denmark um, quite a bit away and how you know, your relationship with um, uh, Leo Goldberg affected you in writing the, the film. Yes, <clears throat> thanks Lori. Um, <clears throat> well, of course, Ken and I met in the mid eighties when I was um, um, in grad school at NYU. Um, uh, uh, pursuing my master's in dramatic writing, screenplays and plays. And uh, Ken was directing commercials. I went by to visit him. We had a mutual friend, a Danish uh, uh, gentleman that we're still pals with, Peter Christian. Uh, and um, we just started talking for a while about, you know, how we might work together. Uh, it, Ken maybe had a seed of a thought of, about this, but then he went back to Denmark, got his 
whole operation up and running. I finished my degree. I was working weekends as a reporter at Sports Illustrated, honing my, my skills as a journalist and as a reporter. Um, and, and then out of the blue, uh, after Ken had left uh, New York for a year or more, he called and said, okay, uh, I know what I want to do and I want you to come help. And so I got on a plane and went and spent uh, four, five, six weeks straight in Copenhagen and began to research uh, the, the story of the rescue. And what overwhelmed me personally was how little I knew about the Holocaust. And seeing that story in USA Today just about two weeks ago, where so many millennials and Gen Z have no clue about six million uh, Jews uh, losing their lives in the Holocaust, uh, the, 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 about the Holocaust in effect, that was, that was stunning. But I realized, it made me think back, how little I had been taught. Uh, going to fine schools in New York, <laughs> uh, fine colleges, grad school, the whole thing. I still did not, I'd never been truly exposed to the depth uh, that one should to understand the Holocaust and hate and, and, and how it carries forward to, to today. Um, but you mentioned Leo. Uh, when I came back from Copenhagen uh, uh, that after that first trip, I, I knew I needed help. I needed an expert. And uh, this was pre-internet, but somehow I got to know of Leo and his book, The Rescue of Danish Jews, which he edited when he was uh, an active professor at NYU. I moderated a conversation with him earlier this summer for the museum. And he, he, started, he opened his heart to Ken and to me. He opened his heart, he opened his family, his story, his faith, and his youth. He was 13 when he was rescued. Um, in, and, and he came over, he, he helped me so much. He brought me to a conference and introduced me to experts. That was a conference in Nebraska of all places uh, uh, on the rescue of, of Danish Jews. And um, his, his expertise, both as a psychologist, which is his, his expertise, as a historian, and as one who lived it, that, that three pronged understanding of this experience was invaluable for people like Kelly, uh, Tova, T.B. Sweeney, Daniel Benzali, Ken, and, and all of us. And he opened the doors to the Jewish community there for us as well. So yeah. uh, many- And I remember when you, um, when you interviewed Leo earlier this summer that he held up um, a sculpture that he had actually smuggled on, you know, from Denmark onto this little fishing boat um, as he waded out into the water. And um, it was just so obvious that this was, you know, a turning point in his life, um, but that his research, which, you know, includes the motivation, trying to understand what made, you know, non-Jews risk their lives for Jews and what makes one person become a resistor, uh, really that's part of what is embedded into the film. And again, is part of what makes it such a unique and valuable film. I just add before you move on, Kelly, that uh, Laurie, one of the things that Leo helped us do also was sep separate myth from reality. So that the, the, the king wearing the Jewish star was actually a myth, it never actually happened. So he helped us understand that. And he helped us understand the simple human moral courage is how he put it on the cover of his book. That was the Danish people uh, and, and, and what they did during those days. Um, and, and I would like to, to, to just throw in uh, uh, some observations here because I, we, we knew we were going to do this and I've been looking into a lot of, I think one of the things yeah, I, I realized when I came back and when I started thinking about it is that, that being Jewish here in Denmark is you foremost a Dane and then you, you have your personal religious beliefs as being Jewish, but it was, it was, so it wasn't Danes helping Jews escape into Sweden. It was Dane helping other Danes. They, 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 we never, they never saw it like, oh, you're Jewish, that's why. When, when, when they, 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 that's why the whole country stood up. And that's one, one of the scenes that we want to show in the, in, in, in the clip, hopefully, is that where Kelly is stuck in a tram. Uh, it's very important to, to say that, that, that 
you were foremost things, and it maybe have something to do with the fact that the, the, the Jewish population of Denmark had been here for many, 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 many years. It was not like very established in, the, in, in society and, 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 and the country. So it's always been, I mean, I've gone through my whole youth, probably being best pals with, 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 with boys that were Jewish, but it, it, was, it was never something that was spoken about or, or an issue. Uh, that was a personal thing. But they, and I think that was really the reason why at, that, that, that scene also came about. It was basically Danes helping other Danes who happened to be Jewish. Yeah. And, and one of the other remarkable things within the field of Holocaust studies is that unlike in some countries like France, where France protected its own Jews, but then there were refugees who had come from Czechoslovakia and uh, Germany, and they were treated differently. Um, in Denmark, Leo, his family came from Czechoslovakia originally. So he was not an old Danish family, if I remember correctly. He was in this group of refugees and um, that led him to speak out about refugees today and, and so on. Um, but I do think that's an interesting piece again about the uniqueness of the, the Danish case. And now I wanted to turn to some of the special scenes in the film. Um, and um, the opening is very striking with the Nazis marching down the street. And then we are taken inside a movie theater and we see the Nazis marching on the screen on a propaganda film. Um, and then marching backwards as the saboteurs force the filmmaker to play the film backwards. So there's some really interesting techniques um, you used even in just the opening. I don't know if Actually, I just let me just stop you there because I, I I'm not quite sure that they that the, the operator was running the film backwards. I think as I remember, the these films came from England, dropped by parachutes, and that was part of that whole uh, small things we were doing because they weren't exploding and big uh, fighting or anything like that. So it's a very subtle type of. Of, of 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 telling that something was wrong. So that film actually was, and I, Damien probably have the name for it because he remember better than I do. But there were it was actually a resistance film produced in England that they distributed, and then in the theater we could they could show that like that. But let's see it. So very very important. Um, and then um, and then Kelly, you get involved with trying to rescue one of the saboteurs. Um, and, you know, the story unfolds as you take this big risk of bringing him into your house and hiding him. Um, do you want to talk about just that one scene and then we'll show the clip? Um, what, you know, what were you, what do you think your character was feeling as um, you made the decision, you saw, you know, one of these Danish resistors who was injured um, I, think I think it's just a reflection of what Kenneth is talking about, which um, we definitely talked about before we started shooting, which is that it was Danes helping Danes. And I had the privilege of speaking to people, you know, who were actually there in the resistance, and they all said the same thing, that they did not consider what they were doing was that brave. They just considered that this is what you do to help your fellow countrymen. You see someone hurt, it's your responsibility to help. And um, I think that that scene speaks to the larger issue of what Ken is talking about is what I consider to be great bravery in the Danes. The Danes themselves considered it to be just what we do. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that's a great transition to this particular scene um, in the film. Samantha, would you mind uh, queuing up? Yep, just, just a moment. I'll share my screen. From a day in October, 
Ya. Hey, hey, bad, So Kelly, what is it that like? It you every time. Yeah. Every time, I'm like, oh, oh no, is she gonna get out? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, how, how, do, how does she take that risk and even greater risk in the film? And um, I thought maybe I could also ask you to talk about um, in the film, the parents who initially are much more skeptical about um, the idea of resistance, um, but especially the mo your mother in the, in the film, how she becomes kind of your collaborate, you know, collaborator with you to help first nurse one uh, individual, one resistance fighters, but then it becomes much more of a risk-taking undertaking. Yeah, I think that um, the father's character, um, I mean, that's typical of a father wanting to protect the entire family. Um, let's just keep our heads down and get through this. You know, that wonderful line, if they want Danish meat, if they want Danish butter, let them take it, meaning the Nazis. And um, myself, my character and my mother, once I get her on my side, um, have not that hard of a time convincing my father's character, my father to get on board and that we have to resist and that what's at stake is greater than our family's safety. And that's the part of courage that is inspiring to me and that I can only hope that I would rise to one-tenth of that amount of courage. Um, I think we all sit around and think, what would we do in that situation? And um, that's why I think it's so important to get this film out there because we need to keep asking ourselves, what would we do in that situation? Because we're always in that situation. So what are we doing every day to further the coming together of our differences instead of you know, pointing out what's different and persecuting people who aren't like us. Very well said. Um, Damien, um, do you wanna comment on this scene or another scene that you think is important for showing the risks that the family is going uh, through? And, and in writing these scenes, did you, were you inspired by any part of Leo's story um, in capturing any particular elements of this risk taking? Well, I'd say um, uh, it was a number of things. This was uh, this this that particular scene uh, came out of the some of the uh, hours, days, months of research that I did, and really we we created uh, a fictionalized Jewish family. And uh, Ken and I felt it was important to empower that family, not just have them be rescued, but be play this active uh, part in their rescue, in in the resistance, as Kelly put it earlier. And so those, uh, um, you know, so many different disparate single acts were done in the story of the Danish resistance and the story of the Danish rescue. We kind of um, uh, created a mosaic of moments and um, um, uh, bombings, if you will, that we did. There was a famous uh, bombing using a case of beer. So how could I not use that? As, as a thing that we incorporate in the film. Uh, Kelly's father's character was uh, an accountant at a factory, so we turned the, his adding machine into uh, a weapon. Uh, um, but these were things, these are creative things that, that, that uh, um, 
that reel before in the movie theater was from the research, as Ken said. So all those different things uh, came from uh, months of research, talking to Jewish families that lived through it, like Leo and others that he introduced us to, talking to fi uh, fishermen who actually spirited people away on the boats. Um, but what I do want to mention also is that um, I, I, I shared this before we got on. I have the call sheet uh, uh, for our crew from 30 years ago today. Today, we filmed the, the ultimate scene in the film. Um, it was um, uh, 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 on October 1st, 1990, that we shot the, that scene where Kelly and her family are spirited away in a fishing boat to Sweden. Someone on the chat had asked about um, uh, uh, the boats and, and that was an extraordinary enterprise that really went over the period of multiple weeks. We called it a day in October because it was a moment in time that we tried to document. But it was really a month, the month of October where most of the rescue transpired and we had a great conversation with the gentleman who is the keeper of, a, um, of the Museum of Jewish Heritage um, boat in uh, Mystic Seaport the fishing boat, uh, Danish fishing boat there. Um, so uh, it was really um, from all the inputs, uh, Lori, that we came together and empowered Kelly's character and her family's, the characters in her family. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the fishing boats because I think it's important to know that both the Museum of uh, Jewish Heritage has one in cooperation with Mystic Seaport and then the Holocaust Museum in Washington has one. Yes. And again, that, that this film touches those material objects and brings them to life. Um, so you can really appreciate what it was like to have to go down and hide in, 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 the, bo in the bottom of the boat. Um, and, and Ken, did you have a favorite scene you wanted to talk about or did you want to add something about this scene? You know, I, I, it's, um, I, I particularly like the, 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 the one you just showed, but there is another scene that I think it's important uh, in the bigger picture. Uh, and I, I don't know if we did it that on, on the day that Damien is mentioning, because I can't remember the, the whole call for that night. But there was a very interesting scene on the, the road who leads, uh, the group of people was, uh, was hiding in a brick factory, uh, a round circle building up north in Snekerstein, I think it's called. And they were going to have to go down to the beach or down to, to the harbor uh, and, and, and go on the boat. And there, were, and there was a scene there where we tried to illustrate how, 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 how weird the whole thing, how crazy the whole thing was that they, they, they are they, they're running over this little girl uh, I think it was, uh, I don't know her name, but she was, she ran across and with the resistance and there was a German, what? I have her name and someone in the chat says it was her cousin. It is oh, her well, cousin. Oh, there you go. Anina uh, so, 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 that's true. And then, you know, the, 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 the scene is, is about the fact that, that there were, uh, there was a German patrol. Again, as I said earlier, this, it's a very, very small distance. And there was a scene where we wanted to explain because there were in Denmark, as in my research now, I figured out that there, there were two different groups of Germans. There was the Wehrmacht and then there was the SS. And the Wehrmacht's big, biggest issue was to f try to figure out where the invasion was going to come from. It was on Jutland side instead of the Normandy. They, that's what they were worried about. And then the, and, and this was obviously Wehrmacht soldiers. And there was like this exchange between D.P. Sweeney and other resistance guys. And then these, these two German soldiers and it was like what are we doing here you know and, and it was just i thought it was very powerful and just, just okay go on with it it's not you know you don't die for this you don't start a, a shootout so there was a very specific hardcore um ss uh, uh a group and then there was the the and i think it's also the Vandermark people that that uh gave the notice to, uh, to uh, the Jewish population on, uh, on escaping. And that's, we take that around Copenhagen and we go to the synagogue and we hear the whole thing and, and we hide people around the, the city. And it, that's, no, I, I, it, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy and very proud of the film. I just hope now we can get it out there again in a new version. And that's, that's why I would encourage everybody to look at the day in October.com and see if, uh, if, if they would want to be involved with this process. Yeah, but and there's many I, good I, scenes. 
I, I thought that scene really also reminded us that there is a tremendous risk that even though there was a lot of cooperation, there were a few cases where co collaborators turned in Jews that were in hiding and that those were the 500 Jews that were sent eventually to Theresienstadt to, to, to the terrorists and ghetto and, and concentration camps. So it was a big risk um, and, and oh, it wasn't that's... a sure thing that those Jews would be ferried across. The fishermen were worried about being arrested. And, and so there was a lot of um, you know, turmoil. And I, you also mentioned the synagogue. And one of the big issues with Holocaust films is always how to represent Judaism, Jewish ritual. Um, and uh, that's come up in Anne Frank and in, in uh, Schindler's List and in other films. And here, there's actually quite a bit of references um, and in, both in private ceremonies in the Shabbat, um, Kelly, that you, where you and your family around the Shabbat table and then there's a scene where we see the synagogue from the mother's perspective, from up on the balcony. So I was wondering if one of you might want to talk a little bit about the choice to include songs, right? Jewish song as well as ritual as part of the, the film. Well, I, I would say that we, I, I leaned heavily on Leo um, and it, it was uh, important that uh, this family be religious Right, and that they were uh, active in the synagogue, uh, as Leo's family was. His father had been the cantor uh, during this period yeah. of time, and uh, that uh, bringing some of the community. Ken had friends who, 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 who brought in and helped. Since I didn't know, and uh, interestingly, I'd asked some of my New York Jewish friends for help, and they were no help to me. So the <laughs> Danish Jews helped me. Uh, Kelly, over, over to you to add anything to that. Well, I just appreciated, as a Jewish person, um, the desire to represent authentically some of the prayers and songs. Um, I know that my friends and family watching the film, the people who are Jewish, they love to see, you know, the singing of those songs. It makes them feel... Um, represented. Um, there's a lot of talk about representation these days and uh, how important that is. And I agree that it is. And it just it brings an authenticity and um, a warmness um, and specificity to the family. Well put, yeah. And, and um, we, we don't have Tova with us, but there's one of the scenes where she is, you know, only can take one suitcase uh, to pack and she insists on putting in her Shabbat candles um, and the resistance fighter doesn't understand why something so heavy has to be in the suitcase and and we know that that is a true story that there were many Jews who fled and they insisted on packing um, ritual objects we know that from you know what remains in Auschwitz and other camps so that was another very authentic detail that enhances the the film um, and there's even, I think, a Havdalah service. So it's, you know, it's the full range of ritual. Um, so we're almost um, towards the Q&A. And so I just want to go around one more time and ask if any of you, if there's anything we haven't addressed so far that you want to bring up about the film, um, a favorite detail, something that a viewer might not notice the first time, um, or anything about uh, one of the characters. Well, I would love to talk about um, the strong female young character that Damien wrote and that Kenneth directed. I feel that this was way ahead of its time. Um, I, my character, Sarah, I don't want to give everything away for people that haven't seen it, but um, my character gets to shoot a Nazi and that was very satisfying as an actor and um, a young woman to have such a large part of the story and not be the girlfriend of the person who gets to shoot the Nazi. And that's one of the things that really drew me to the film when I read it. I knew that this character was so special and that the film was so special and I really wanted to be a part of it. And I'm so thrilled that I got to play Sarah. Yeah. 
And, and what's, what's incredible to me is that it coincides with the Gerda three and, and the story we, we know about Henny. So we know there are these young women, 22 years old, very brave, yes. you know, involved with re rescue and resistance. We know that in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, 20% of the women who fought with guns and Molotov cocktails were women. So, but it's not something that was well known in 1991. So it's just- right. Right. Yeah, it's incredible. You played it beautifully, and oh, thank you, thank you. And um, yeah, kudos, Damien. You figured I, this out before anybody else. I, I would say, um, well, thank you for that, and thanks, Kelly. But I, I, one of the little details that I remember from behind the scenes in the production was the uh, set designer telling me that uh, when we shot at the synagogue uh, and the exterior that they had to uh, paint over or uh, clean up uh, graffiti that was 1990 anti-Semitic uh, 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 messaging and put up 1943 anti-Semitic messaging. So that only reinforces the, the why of what Kenneth is after here, what you're after, Lori, with the museum, that you can never stop telling this story, that USA Today uh, clipping from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it, 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 it just needs to be told again and again to the next generation and, and digitizing it in this new way will um, not make that graffiti go away, but hopefully it'll change minds and, 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 and make people more aware. And that's hopefully what we can do with a story that's a, it really built from a collection of, uh, of amazing courage across the landscape of Denmark. And, and Ken, do you want to say anything about the title? Did you come up with the title or was that Damien? I mean, it is the whole- I, I, I the don't recall. Of, it's the month of October, but it's a That's very true. special yeah. day. I, I don't recall, but I was just sitting here thinking about if I remember any, any good stories. And, and, and there's actually one story which I find for also for all the film buffs, hopefully there are some out there. I actually, um, and I don't know if Damien remember, but if not, this is a, a, a little personal secret, uh, but it's coming out now. I actually invested in a print of a day in October. And that time, you know, uh, uh, an hour long or 112 minutes, whatever it is, uh, is, is, is a big, huge uh, can of film. So I invested in a print. I sent it to Amblin with Federal Express 30 years ago, or maybe 25 years ago to Mr. Spielberg. Haven't heard a word, but I hopefully, uh, if anybody knew about it, uh, he should be having a print of a day in October uh, at his library because I, I, never, I never got it back. And, and if, if Federal Express cannot deliver and not sign for it, uh, Ula, our Ula Kito, my, my assistant, 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 uh, was, was remember, remember me and was looking for the Federal Express receivable note. But uh, yeah, so, so the print has been out there um, and I hope you had a chance to see it. Um, now it's just important to get it out there again to tell the story, as Damien said. Did you know that, Damien, that I sent it to Spielberg? Uh, yes, I think I wrote your cover letter. Oh, maybe. Did we? Yeah, well, there you go. So. So, Samantha, I think but, we're ready for questions. Lori, yeah. you choked up. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, so, we have a few questions coming in here. Um, here's a question, I guess, can be addressed to Damien or, or anyone else that might want to jump in. But um, the question is How does working on a historical or historical fiction piece compared to other film projects that you have worked on throughout your career? It's kind of a broad question, but. Well, um, I would say I, I, uh, I love this experience because it opened my eyes to how much I didn't know about an extraordinary moment in time in history. And, uh, you know, I think about what we're living through now and the kind of reassessment of American history and how much I didn't probably learn about our own history here in the States. Um, so um, I think about that experience more in that context than comparing it to other projects that I've written 
but but um, many of because and indeed many of uh, uh, the scripts that I've written have been based on uh, moments in time, history, people. Um, uh, uh, so I've done more rooted in uh, fact-based storytelling than than uh, original. Um, but that that opening up your eyes to stories, to greatness, to uh, courage is 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 a, a gift of uh, th that this part of my career and now I could, if i could just add one thing to that one um it's a complicated uh, thing to make movies it's a very difficult craft and a difficult art form and i have to admit uh i i thought about after we were finished and going through this whole experience of getting it out there and people liking it or not liking it or papers or Lennon Melton loved it. And, and you know, there's a lot of different things. I, I, I told myself, I'm not going to do a historical film next time. I want to do one where I can, I can shoot a lamppost the way that it is today. Uh, but, but it doesn't take away the, 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 the our story, but it, it was just, it, it's, it's tough. It's, it's a tough, uh, tough, 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 uh, experience and uh, we had to do so many c cut corners and not being able to shoot that way and you know you can only point this way and it has to be historical correct you know somebody asked about the cars and the trams and, and that was just a lot of great guys in the prop departments um uh, the people that we had working with us was phenomenal and uh, but you know that that tram only runs like uh, 100 meters and we found a place in some part of Copenhagen where they haven't taken up the trams yet uh, rails so we could just run at that little piece there and that's of course today's day you can shoot everywhere but um, yeah. next time thank you um here's a question also uh, I think Kenneth might uh, be the most appropriate to address would you happen to know um if holocaust education is part of the Danish curriculum in higher education Ooh, that I cannot tell you because I don't know. I don't recall. I went out of seventh grade in school. I'm completely self. Uh, I never went to film school. I, I, I'm completely self-educated. So I, I can't tell you. I don't know, but I will certainly look into it. My kids just got out of school after 11, 12 years. I, I don't know. But I think it also comes back to, and it must, it must be somehow, but, but again, it comes back to the whole thing about you, you're first a Dane and then you happen to have a, a, a religious belief, uh, the stewards, it, it's not the other way around, which is one of the things I experienced in America when I worked in New York, you know, people tell me, well, so what are you? I'm Jewish. And then you happen to be American. And here it's completely different. Here you happen to be Danish and then you have a faith. So, I, I would think so, I, I, I don't, but I don't know. I can't tell you. It, it, it's, it's not exactly that, Samantha, but I was fascinated when I interviewed Leo Goldberger with your help earlier uh, this year, um, where the scholarship continues. And he had been surprised, despite writing what I thought was the definitive book on the rescue, of learning over time how many children had not gone from Denmark to uh, Sweden, that children um, had dozens uh, of, of Danish children had been left behind because the parents thought that was a smarter way to save them, that um, because they, they couldn't risk uh, them crying out. Um, and uh, though we learned from my interview of the boat keeper, um, um, that uh, the, ch the children on the boats were drugged to to be quiet so that they wouldn't cry out in the cramped cold uh so uh, i thought that was fascinating that research uh decades later from when we made this film is still unfolding and unfurling new details of the rescue story thank you damien um also related to holocaust education uh we have a uh, a question from a viewer who asks how how do you think we can get this film seen by students and teachers in order to confront rising anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial? Well, the answer is basically, uh, we're trying and I'm trying to, to raise sufficient funds to, to bring the film into 
uh, a modern technology 4K uh, resolution uh, because nobody can see it right now. As I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I wrote to a gentleman, uh, the, the one, the DVD on Amazon is there illegally and I'm trying to take it down because it's copyright infringing. Uh, so hopefully if they follow a day in October.com, uh, they can contact me there. And uh, as soon as we, we get this, Laurie has been incredible, I have to tell you, right, with the whole world listening in. And, and we have made a, uh, a, a, an application uh, at, with claims uh, to do this post-production um, with help of, f from their help. And, uh, but it's an expensive um, task. And I hope we can... Uh, encourage someone to call to contact me and see if they know someone that or that's a, I actually just today got in contact with a contact that Laurie also talked to uh, Kelly and I wrote him uh, to take a look at the at the website at dayinoctober.com and see if he had contacts and it's how this whole thing started with with Damien and his friend Jack the the, the CEO of, of the museum and and and, and that's whole way of going about it. So, so the only way to see the film uh, legally and, and in the right manner is to, to have some patience and, and wait until we hopefully success, successfully can, can re-digitize the film. Uh, I got the film behind me and it's just a question of being able to do it. Yeah, we're, we're very grateful to the platform, the Museum of Jewish Heritage for co-sponsoring this with the Wagner Holocaust Center because it's really helped us to get the word out, some Scandinavian organizations have contacted us. And um, as far as film goes, we know that um, it's, it's of course very important to show your students a film, but in a single hour, 80,000 people can see a film on television, on Netflix. Um, and it's, it, you know, its in, impact can be broadened. And that's why the Claims Conference has invested so much in film. And we're hoping that they might support this project. We are hoping um, there's other Holocaust film um, organizations, and we're hoping they're going to hear about this. We're going to reach out to them. And um, yeah, and hopefully in a year we'll be able to do a, a celebratory Absolutely. Uh, webinar at the Museum of Jewish Heritage and let you know that you can now watch it or it's going to be on PBS or that you can watch it on Netflix. That's, that's the goal. Actually, I, I need to tell you that because I looked at over a list of, this, of the sales and what the film originally has been shown in more than 20 countries. So it has done its part. It was also on ABC New, ABC uh, American Broadcasting System uh, back there. Um, but it's never been on in the, the, because the whole world has changed and it's streaming, 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 and it's Disney and it's Apple and it's Amazon and it's all these kind of things, uh, and Netflix, it, 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 it hasn't been there. And that's where we're, our objective is to put it there to get as many people to see it around the world. Um, and it's a story that never goes out of uh, touch. I mean, it, it, it's, and there's a big world out there that needs to see it. So, but they won't, they won't see an analog version of a, of a film that was done 30 years ago. They need to have it, but it's, it's a small story and it's as important today and as good as today as it was that. And listen, I've seen grown men cry and uh, it's, uh, it's just, very pleased. Um, I was about. Oh, Tova is there. Yes, I, we, I was about to say that we've just run out of time, but Tova, in the nick of time, has just joined us. So I, I can't possibly close it out here. <laughs> Hello, Tova. Oh, boy. Hi. Hello. Hi, T Tova. How are you? We're so glad that you're able to join us. Um, oh, wait, you have to chase me. You can't just put down, see you, and without a, a time and a date again. I'm sorry. It's October 1st today. My manuscript was due but i got it in early i'm so sorry i'm so we're, we're just glad that you're here you can speak for a few minutes about the astonishing mother character that you play but maybe first i should introduce you um oh. for anybody i don't know who might be that doesn't know who you are um to tova Feldshu, as i'm sure many of you know um extraordinary award-winning acting career spanning stage and screen um, from the NBC miniseries, The Holocaust, where she portrayed Helena Slomenka. Um, Helena and Slomova. Helena Slomova. Slom Slomova. Um, and then on Law and Order, 
Um, and then on Broadway in Yentl, in Lend Me a Tenor, and of course in Golda's Balcony, um, one of the longest running shows um, on Broadway, longest running one woman show on Broadway. Her movies include Kissing Jessica Stein, A Walk on the Moon, Happy Accidents with Marie. Marissa Tomei, The Corrupter, and many more. And we're also grateful for your humanitarian work, um, and in particular in relation to this project, for your work as Emma Kublitz, The Rock of the Family, shaken up by the roundup of the Danish Jews in a day in October. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what it was like to, well, first of all, maybe, you know, this film compared to Golda's Balcony, this idea of the strong Jewish women, um, and then what it was like specifically in this film to, you know, play this mother, the mother who is so central, you know, to the story. I think that particularly with Daniel, who was the father, he was superb and loaded with anxiety all the time. It was one, I was a wonderful foil to him to try to stay even keeled. Also, it was very easy working with Kelly and very easy working with Ken. How are you, Ken? You look like David Letterman from Denmark. Look uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, why it's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while, it's been a while oh, my dear. You look good. You look good. Fantastic. And uh, Ken took such good care of us, as did his producers. I remember I stayed next to the Rosenberg Palace in a beautiful flat. And uh, I was with my baby girl, Amanda Clare, who was two or three years old, and our nanny was a, a, a child who was in college, wonderful woman named Samantha. And that baby girl is now 30, 32 years old and with one child on the way and a son named Raphael. So we're, we're in good shape. The, the mother, in general, the mother, I also just finished playing RBG. I had the honor of playing the Supreme Court Justice before she died. So I got a chance to meet her on four, four occasions and become a fond acquaintance of hers. I think as my career is panned out and changing my name from Terry Sudatova and then having the whole state of Israel and the international Jewish community land on my head because though Shakespeare says, what's in a name, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. In fact, when you have a name, it is a very shortcut to a, when you, uh, to a perception to the perceived value of the individual. And nobody's life is about your life. Their life is about their own concerns. Can you hear me clearly? Are you hearing me clearly? Yes. yes. So, um, what has happened in my career and also with Emma Kublitz is that I was, I was gifted with these fabulous roles from Yentl that led to Helena Slomova, that would lead to Emma Kublitz, that would lead to Judy Stein, that would lead to Lillian Kantrowitz in A Walk on the Moon that would lead to a Golda Meir. I remember saying to my manager, I'm not gonna take this thing. I mean, it's just another Jewish mother. And she said, jerk, it's the mother of a state. That's what she said about Golda, don't be silly. And she who was not even of our faith said, you must take this role. And of course it became one of the great roles of my career. But uh, uh, Emma Kublitz too is that, is that ballast. I think because women have the body privilege of giving birth, that once we give birth, very often we can see into the future well and we can stay level to sustain life, to sustain life. And I think that was part of my function in, uh, in that piece. I remember meeting Life Donde, who was a consul general in, 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 to the United States, I think from Denmark. And he told me how he was a little boy as a Jewish boy and he was in the rowboats from uh, from Denmark to get him to Sweden where he was protected. Listen, it's the only country that did it. We're so lucky that Hitler thought that the Danes were his model Aryans. So he, it's not that he closed one eye, just like a favorite child. He let them get away with more than other, other countries with Jewish populations. And, and so do you remember like any specific scenes that you, you know, in the film that, um, I mean, I was, I'm very struck when, when the very first time that uh, Kelly, that the, the daughter brings the injured resistance fighter into the house and instead of being sort of uh, very wary or shutting her down, that suddenly you kick into your role as a nurse and. Um, right, the, su the sustaining of life, forgive me, there's airplanes that our, our home in the country is near Gabriski Airport and the National Guard and of course 
of course, under this president, all these military things are kind of running around and with COVID. Um, it, the sustenance of life. Once life comes through you, you, you see it in other, in other areas. I was just watching a, a series called The French Village. It was brilliant about the Fran France's experience during the war, which had so much more subtlety than the American experience. My father was in the intelligence because he spoke fluent German. And you know, these, these wonderful Americans were these wide-eyed, not innocent, but really idealistic. We were idealistic up to pretty much up to 200, 2016. And now everything's been mashed to hell. And uh, I think at any time we can make a political statement, it's important to vote for Joe Biden because you're voting for a democracy. And I want to take a stand on that publicly. And that's how I feel. And if you're in, don't, don't, get, don't get seduced by Trump's plan for Israel. Don't get seduced. Be very careful. Um, in all events, there's, there's certainly a lot of um, people who feel that these ho Holocaust centers have to take a position in this election. Um, but I, I do, I do want to ask Damien um, if you have a question for Tova about, you know, how she was able to bring to life. Um, you had these two very different parents, right? One who really is very slow to embrace resistance, but then once he embraces it, he finds himself actually, you know, blowing up uh, you know, a Nazi office building. And then um, to Tova's role, um, you know, how, how did you feel about that? And, and you know, what might you say to Tova about how she brought to life that role? Well, I'd say that Tova brought strength uh, that is inherent in her to both the role and to the set. And she uh, helped animate the project as a whole, uh, both on the film, on, on screen <clears throat> and off screen and became a kind of a glue to all of us. And I, I can remember, uh, I, 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 Tova made a mention, but she worked hard with Leo to meet the, the Jewish community of, of, uh, of Copenhagen. And that embrace by her of them helped, can help the production, helped us get into the synagogue and, and, and do it right. Tova earlier, Lori was asking about a lot of the Jewish cultural touches that we included, the, the, the expressions of faith in the film. And I think you're, you, you brought that to life over and over again in a way that I, I, I could put something inert on a page and suggest something, but you, you brought it to life. And that, that gave the film authenticity and, and credibility that is- um, you're, in you're a doll. You're a doll. Also, you know, we were in our salad days and Daniel, who was such a, who was a great artist, he was agonizing over certain aspects of the script, agonizing. Mm -hmm. And it was slightly incomprehensible to the normals around. I mean, maybe I'm just, I don't know, maybe I'm a B student in script, uh, in script analysis, but it was very interesting to try to smooth that way for him, which I did with 19 different kinds of herring on the Yom Kippur in Russia, on the on Rosh Hashanah, and then break the fast. I tried to swallow mm. Daniel Benzali at any opportunity, and um, I I certainly loved being in Denmark and being part of the conservative movement at B'nai Jeshurun. And I'm out here in the Hamptons in Quad, so I go to Mark Schneier, who's a, a modern Orthodox at the Hampton Synagogue. Actually, Sukkot is tomorrow. But I was so pleased the conservative movement in Judaism is like the Suzuki approach to Judaism. You learn tefillah, you learn prayer book Hebrew. So when I went to the high holidays at this synagogue, I couldn't read the Danish, but I could read the Hebrew. I could manage and get to and pray. And a Danish Jewish family did invite me to their home. And when I was a little student at 18 years old in Besançon, France, and went to Yom Kippur services there, not one French family extended a hand to me. I went back to my own French family. They were serving ham that night. It was like, wow. what could I do? I was a student exchange student. So it was very interesting that the Danes, I find are kind and have a lot of equilibrium by nature. Well, I just want to add a, a, a little personal note because also you referenced your, your children. <clears throat> I came to Denmark for the production three weeks after our daughter was born. <clears throat> and my wife brought our daughter three weeks later when she was six and her, I guess her eardrums were good enough to fly. And Kelly Wolf was her very first babysitter so that my wife and I could go out 
on our uh, and have a dinner uh, in Newhound uh, 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 on our own. So thank you, Kelly, our first babysitter. There you are. There you are in very good nature. And I was with Kelly when Leonard Bernstein died. She came to the set. She came to the set that day, and she could not. Um, she was extremely upset, but she was friendly. I believe, if I remember properly, with one of the children. That's yes. Right. Is that right, Kel? With Alexander, he's one of my very best friends. I, rem I remember that day and you were a great comfort to me. So thank you, thank you. My pleasure. It's my and pleasure. Let, me just, let me just jump in and, and just say, uh, and I, I said that to Kelly the other day, uh, that, that the casting process was so interesting and the same with you, Tova. Uh, basically the whole cast, it, it, was, it was such an eye opener because it was just right there, right? You knew it right the, when you walked in. I think we met, I think we first time we met in, was in New York, Kelly was in Los Angeles. Um, but thanks for, for Daniel Pensali, who is a, an incredible actor, uh, Utova, Kelly and D.P. Sweeney, um, and all the people that made this possible because it's not a one man bandstand, it's a, it's a collective group of people that, 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 that did this picture and it goes down to the Jimmy Levins, the grip, Henning Kassensen, the cameraman, the set designers, the, the, the production managers, uh, Peter Beckel, uh, Eric Heffron, the first AD, an American guy that I, I still talk to 30 years later. And, and we're all in contact. And um, I think it only happens when you work with good people and the right people. Uh, I haven't seen Michael Singer, but Michael Singer, if you are watching, you said you were going to watch. I haven't been able to see it. We had a, an incredible publicist called Michael Singer, who was uh, an incredible person. So, so all these people, after 30 years, we still see them and we still talk. Damien and I has, have worked on several uh, projects together. And, and the Hans Christian Andersen is, is something we hope one day can get flying. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a trip, a good one. And I just hope to over that, at, as, as I said earlier, you were... I set up a website uh, called a day in October.com with the purpose of re digitizing the film because the film cannot be shown anymore because of the analog version that it's in. No, net, no streaming service or anything like that would have the film right now. So it can't be seen. So if I can do anything or we can do something, it is make sure the awareness of the film by re raising the money to get this film out there again. And Laurie has been incredible. Damon, everybody's been, Fantastic, and we, we hopefully with the claims people and other organizations, we can uh, we can raise enough fund to get it out there and show it to the world. Great, so thank money, you very much. How much money do we need, Ken? How much money do we actually need? We have a budget about uh, eighty thousand dollars to do a, a completely redigitization and color correction and and everything. I mean, just giving the the film a completely new right. title sequences and all those kind of things and and commercial and 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 uh, uh, small f film, you know, for uh, it's just with everything. So that's our budget. So and hopefully, is there we can a way to make from... small donations, Ken? Is there like a GoFundMe site yet? No, no, I haven't. I mean, it's I set up the adaynotober.com and people to contact me to see if there's organizations or, you know, if you if you have to get seventy five to eighty thousand uh, dollars, it 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 it's it's, it's a lot of money. Um, it will take place in New York City, the, the digitization uh, with Postworks, uh, Technicolor Postwork will do it. Uh, but um, so I'm not sure that this, uh, no, I haven't thought about making, you know, you $10, do, $50, whatever. The Americans love GoFundMe. The Jews love to exist. We're afraid of extinction. It's one of our great traits. That's why we keep accomplishing so much. That's why Israel has the most Nobels because mm -hmm. the, you know you have death right here. It's not like over there. And if you don't right. believe in the South Koreans, so you, you can just set up a GoFundMe and ask for small small donations. And all we need is eighty div individuals at eighty thousand or one hundred and sixty at five hundred bucks. I mean, even in COVID, that's that's a walk in the park for many people. I mean, I, I'd give you five dollars for it. So I will. I will. I you, not, you know the the website now, dayontober.com, and that's my, my information and my my Gmail and my phone numbers and everything. There we can talk further there. 
and see like Lori put us in contact with claims organization and what was the other one Kelly uh, no Lori the, we got thanks to, thanks Scandinavia thanks to, the, thanks thank to you, Scandinavia thank yeah you. yeah so I think that it, it's out there we just need to 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 shake the the, the, the whatever and, and and get it going I do too um, there was one interesting question, Damien, for you about if you were writing a preface, given the, you know, the rise of, you know, authoritarianism and in the world today and anti-Semitism, what kind of preface you might want on the screen um, to, you know, to introduce the film. And I don't know, I thought that might be a good way to sort of end our panel, just if anybody wanted to suggest like, you know, what would be a few words, what would be the framing that we would want um, to say? Um, I, I would just, uh, I, I, I can't write the right words right now, but it would be about courage. It, uh, it would be about uh, how courage is uh, a, t a timeless strength that we all need. It's, uh, it's that stoic uh, thing that uh, will carry us through the hardest times as it did then. And so crafting the story of a family that uh, wasn't just the recipient of courage, but demonstrated courage was uh, perhaps the smartest thing I did with that script uh, because uh, the, 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 those characters transformed in ways that the uh, character D.B. Sweeney played, the resistance fighter, didn't really transform. The transformation was in Kelly, Tova, and Daniel and, and taking a stand and standing up for themselves. Uh, and and uh, I think that's, it. I, I'd write it about that. I'd write around that theme of courage. Yeah, and October is a great month for courage. It's also the month that the uprising happened in Auschwitz. And I mean, this is just a very important thing to recognize the resistance and rescue and courage. And we wish um, Ken a lot of luck. Um, and we hope Thank everybody you. who's watching will stay involved in some way to see if there is an opportunity for donations. And I. I want to thank Damien again for being on the board of the Wagner Holocaust Center for six years and for all the advice and direction you've given us to help build this partnership with the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Um, it really is so great to be able to do collaborations together. And thank you to all the panelists, um, uh, Kelly and Tova and Ken and Damien. This was really a special program and I hope all of our participants, including my students and Family, I hope you all will keep this lesson with you um, to make us stronger um, with courage to face what's coming ahead in the next few weeks and months. So thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you, everyone. Take care.